And okay, recording in progress, excellent. Mr. Mejia is also responsible for several other programs at UNITAR. His career spans two decades in private and public sector, including corporate banking, as well as diplomatic service of his country, Ecuador. In 2001, he became the Vice Minister of Economy, representing his country in International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Alex, we are very glad to have you here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. I hope that you can all uh, hear me. Uh, I send you warm greetings from the Palais de Nation in Geneva. And it's my great privilege, of course, to uh, uh, speak in an event in which our uh, United Nations Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Nikhil Seth, will be also participating. So on his behalf and on behalf of UNITAR, I would like to welcome you officially. And in the, if you allow me to share just a few remarks um, uh, to open, allow me to say that it's uh, this high-level event is quite unique. Uh, I hope to all the participants joining from so many countries that you find it useful and that it also motivates you, as it has done to me and to us at UNITAR, to make a strong personal commitment so the cause of uh, plasma-related therapies really advance in the world. So. Um, I would like to uh, extend a special welcome uh, to all of you. And uh, very important uh, to say that your presence today reflects the critical importance of this issue and the urgency with which we must address it and explore perhaps new ways to ensure that life-saving treatments are available to all who need them. This is a global challenge, as you know, that requires a collective effort to address uh, uh, this issue at the highest level and to do it in a holistic manner so no one is left behind. Everyone in developed or developing uh, the developing world needs to better understand what these life-saving uh, saving treatments are. So uh, as we begin this event, I would like to highlight that this initiative is the result of months of collaboration, research, and advocacy from many individuals and organizations who have recognized the urgent need to improve access to plasma-derived therapies. Particularly, I would like to express our appreciation to Takeda Corporation, um, a firm that has empowered us to do what we are doing and that we greatly admire because of their professionalism and the focus on research. Plasma-derived therapies and uh, Takeda will always be associated in my mind because they actually do um, something that is good for the world. Takeda uh, has started this initiative, I should say that, but now we are part of it and fully supporting it. So this is the next step in this journey. Finally, allow me to also say that we are honored uh, to be joined today by a distinguished group of panelists that Jan uh, just mentioned. Uh, they bring a wealth of expertise and insights to this discussion. Together, we will explore the challenges and opportunities facing access to plasma-derived therapies, and try to identify innovative solutions to address these challenges. I am confident that our collective efforts will lead to meaningful progress in this important area, and we at UNITAR look forward to the insights and perspectives that will emerge from our discussions today. With that, thank you for allowing me to inaugurate uh, this very important high-level event, and back to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And now I would like to welcome our first panelist, Mr. Nikhil Seth, who is the United Nations Assistant Secretary General and the Executive Director of UNITAR. Mr. Seth has 35 years of experience as an international and national civil servant. And uh, prior to becoming the head of UNITAR, he was the Director of the Division for Sustainable Development at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. He also served as the head of the office of the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development and has directly participated in the work on the post-2015 development agenda. So, Mr. Seth, from your perspective as one of the authors of the SDGs and Agenda 2030, can you tell us what does the concept of leaving no one behind mean in the context of healthcare access and why is it important? Thank you, Jan. And it's wonderful to be with all 
you distinguished panelists and to the work that is being done by Alex and his team in promoting this spirit of partnership amongst all. So I'm very happy to be part of this panel and to answer your question, Yan. I would say that the principle of leaving no one behind is scattered throughout the text of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. And in fact, there's a lot of strong language that we must try and achieve the SDGs for all. And uh, there is a phrase I remember because I had helped in drafting it. But the SDGs will not have been achieved unless they are achieved for all. This applies across the board to the SDGs, but it has a particular relevance in the health sector and uh, in healthcare access. This is because we are coming out of a very terrible pandemic and uh, we realized then, uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic, that those who did not have access to health services, to medicals, and all the streams of treatment that are required uh, were the ones who suffered the most. And this is as relevant to a pandemic like COVID-19 as it is to other issues and health-related uh, health issues. Income and poverty and remoteness are three elements which make access to medical services very difficult in many of our very poor countries. And how do we overcome this? How do we get into creating partnerships which will reach these furthest behind first? And that is the principle that we enshrined in the SDGs. And I'm so glad that uh, some of these issues will be discussed today in the context of plasma-derived uh, therapies. And we'll be able to see what can we do together to make this happen for the poorest in our societies. And I'm very happy here that Argentina and uh, Malaysia are here, and uh, they will be able to guide us. They are pioneering in what they're doing in a collaborative way to uh, reach the furthest behind. And of course, partnership with Takeda is instrumental in making this happen. So Jan, I hope that answers your question, that the principle of leaving no one behind is something which guides the entire agenda and it has a very special relevance in the area of access to health services. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seth. And allow me to stay with you a little bit more and to follow up with another question based on what you just said. How do you think or what can you tell us that how the UNITAR's new plasma initiative can help, in fact, to address these issues that you just mentioned? Well, I've already elaborated on what leaving no one behind means. And uh, of course, we are focusing on. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Good. So we've talked a little about what leaving no one behind means. And uh, this initiative, which looks at some of the rare diseases, of course, because of diagnostics, and um, the number is not really rare anymore. The types of uh, ailments that we are addressing through plasma-derived therapies, uh, but poverty, income, and excess, as I mentioned earlier, are problems which prevent the poorest from access to these plasma-derived therapies. So UNITAR hopes that through the platform we are creating, by bringing different actors in society, who have a bearing on the outcome of what we do in plasma-derived therapies, we'll be able to reach the furthest. And uh, that's why I think this UNITAR initiative, uh, which is reaching out to uh, those who need it most and uh, in a way which is collegial, which is collaborative, which is in partnership with so many others, uh, that is a very important aspect of this platform and this partnership. The Knowledge Resource Center that we hope to establish will provide a wealth of up-to-date information and resources related to plasma and access to plasma-derived therapies. With this data in one place, and we are developing the resource center to serve as a useful tool for all, for researchers, for policymakers, for practitioners and advocates who will be working to advance this topic as part of global health and development. The fact that we'll be able to get the experience of Malaysia 
and of Argentina to bear on what is their success in using and helping us enrich this platform is also going to be uh, very important. Our aim in UNITAR is to reach people through education, learning, and training, which are the key elements of any capacity building effort we do. And I think this resource center and this platform is a very rich platform for enabling all this. So we build capacity, we learn from experience, we have a multi, uh, you know, a, a large partnership which brings in so many different actors in society. And that is something we want to share on a much larger scale than we have so far. And uh, while we are still in a pilot phase, I'm sure there'll be a cascading effect of this partnership and uh, we'll be able to give the fruits of this partnership to a much, much wider audience. Back to you, Jan. Thank you, thank you very much. Now that we have heard more about this initiative and the UN perspective towards development and the global health, it's, I think, good time to hear now from the private sector, how the private sector sees the sustainable development and the opportunities it offers. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Giles Platford, president of the Plasma Derived Therapies Business Unit at Takeda Company. Mr. Platford joined Takeda in 2009, and since then, he assumed many leading roles in different parts, parts of the world, including Brazil, Middle East, Africa, as well as Europe and Canada. Mr. Platford is also the current global chair of the board for the Plasma Protein Therapeutics Association, the PPTA, which represents the private sector manufacturers of plasma protein therapies. So Mr. Platford, as we have just heard, the sustainable development goals aim to leave no one behind by ensuring that healthcare is accessible to all. How is your company trying to address health disparities and to ensure that all patients, regardless of their socioeconomic status or other situations, have actually access to life-saving therapies. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, for the introduction and, uh, and, and for to Assistant Secretary General Beth for those very compelling uh, opening remarks. Um, and thank you to all the esteemed participants in this panel, uh, our valued partners. It's a great privilege to be here to, today. Uh, and I, I can see very clearly um, that we all have very common goals and a common vision for how to achieve those goals and partnership and collaboration is essential uh, to, to doing that. Takeda is a, a company very committed to achieving sustainable access to medicines uh, right across the world with a particular focus on broadening access and doing that in a sustainable way in developing health systems around the world. And, and that goes well beyond simply securing access to the innovation the, the innovation and the, and the medicines and treatments that Takeda develops. It really goes to strengthening health systems, to improving diagnosis, to leveraging technology to support that, to educating uh, healthcare professionals, and to ensuring that the health systems uh, are set up in a way that is likely tailored to the needs of each health system to ensure that uh, innovative treatments life-saving and life-changing treatments like plasma-derived therapies can be accessible uh, to all. Now, plasma-derived therapies are unique in that they can only be sourced from plasma uh, that, uh, that, that comes from healthy human donors. Um, there are significant costs, uh, very high capital intensity, and a lot of complexity to bring those treatments through to patients. And it's very important that we work together with countries around the world to ensure that we are increasing the supply of plasma. There's significant unmet need today. Uh, and only six countries around the world contribute 90% of the plasma needed to produce plasma diet therapies for these patients who often don't have alternatives and are suffering from rare, complex, and chronic diseases. So these are mostly lifelong uh, patients. And so we're very, very proud to be partnering with uh, public sector, with a prestigious institution like UNITAR, 
uh, with valued partners and patient groups. We have representatives from IPOPI, um, from the World Federation of Hemophilia here today. It's critical that these different stakeholders are working together to find tailored solutions for countries around the world to do their part in ensuring both sustainable supply of plasma, but also strengthening the plasma ecosystem so that these treatments are accessible broadly around the world. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, thank you very much. So now as a very good continuation of this discussion, I would like to turn to our distinguished panelists from Malaysia and Argentina, because um, it is in fact the governments and national institutions who carry the main burden and responsibility for taking care of their citizens' health. So and at the same time, they play the key role, having the decision-making power to implement policies that can influence life of many. So we are, we are very glad that Malaysia and Argentina agreed to join this initiative and by that they show their leadership in the field and also example that can be an inspiration for other countries to follow. But before giving the floor to our two panelists from Malaysia and Argentina, we will share with you now the video message by Her Excellency Dr. Zaliha Mustafa, Minister of Health of Malaysia, who has honored us by recording this message specifically for this particular occasion. So I would like to ask my colleagues now to screen this message. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and warm greetings from Malaysia. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizing committee, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAL, for inviting me to be part of these important milestones of this joint initiative. Theme, leaving no one behind, meeting patients' need for plasma-derived therapies, and I'm indeed honoured to be part of this initiative together with Argentina. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this initiative will certainly bring the National Plasma Fractionations Programme to the next level. The National Plasma Fractionation Programme is driven by the health needs of the people of Malaysia. It is time that our country shall increase the blood donation rate from 22 per thousand populations to 35 to 40 per thousand population. The projected rate will hopefully save Malaysia from the situations of global shortage of plasma-derived medicinal products, PDMP, and achieve self-sufficiency in both red blood cells and plasma demand. Plasma-derived medicinal products, PDMP, are life-saving treatments and have proven to be effective and significantly improve the quality of life for immune deficiencies, immunological disorders, trauma, burns and infections. A number of PDMPs are included in the WHO model list of essential medicines, emphasizing their importance in healthcare and the need to facilitate access to this product all over the world. Similarly, the World Health Assembly in 2010 adopted a resolution, WHA 63.12, which urges member states to take all the necessary steps to establish, implement and support nationally coordinated, efficiently managed and sustained blood and plasma programs according to the availability of resources with the aim of achieving self-sufficiency unless special circumstances prelude it. Progresses in medical treatments have resulted in increased demand of blood and blood component therapy, leading to increased productions of blood components, mainly red cells, platelets and plasma by the transfusion service. We can further optimise the usage of blood through the productions of recovered plasma from blood donation. That could be made available for fractionation into PDMP to fulfil patients' needs and this will enhance efficient blood service management. Although Malaysia has started the contract fractionations program with the Commonwealth Serum Laboratory since 1991, we still encounter several factors that pose some challenges towards achieving self-sufficiency for PDMP. Presently, the current fractionation program in Malaysia is able to supply about 60% immunoglobulin, 40% of albumin and 50% of factor VIII concentrate to patients in country. The remaining is still compensated by purchasing more expensive PDMP from the international market. 
we recognize that inadequate supply of quality plasma that meet the good manufacturing practice GMP standards and insufficient volumes of plasma are the main limiting factors in Malaysia. Upgrading of 22 selected blood selection centers, which was initiated in 2014, has helped some of the blood collection centers to improve the quality, traceability and volume of plasma collected. However, the progress was stunted by COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in a reduction of about 30% to 40% of the total blood collections in the country. Increased demand of PDMP also poses a challenge, especially during the global shortage of plasma. Thus, judicious use of the products needs to be emphasised among the treating clinicians based on local or internationally accepted guidelines. In relation to this, I fully support the participations of Malaysia in the pilot project of this initiative by UNITA and Takeda, focusing on, focusing on strengthening the country's healthcare system to meet the patient's need in the country. Though these participations, I hope Malaysia will further benefit from the knowledge sharing and the understanding about plasma fractionation. This project will be able to create a platform that will bring together expert policy makers, government officials, industry representatives and patients to work towards strengthening resilience of health system to meet global patients' need for PDMP through development of knowledge base, policies and standards that govern quality and safety of plasma manufacturing based on the latest scientific evidence, best practice and recommendations. I am pleased to share that the present working committee from the National Blood Centre of Malaysia, clinicians, academicians and patients organisation such as my Poppy and the Haemophilia Society of Malaysia with the guidance from UNITA and Takida are able to come together and discuss openly about the challenge and opportunities to maximise the return of investment and achieve self-sufficiency of PDMP in Malaysia. Lastly, I would like to congratulate UNITA on the launch of a knowledge platform that would increase the awareness, build partnerships and facilitate access to late scientific knowledge and best practice in this field. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. We also are very thankful for this message. And now, representing the Ministry of Health of Malaysia, we have here with yeah. us today Dr. Afifa Hassan. Yeah. Director of the National Blood Center of Malaysia. Dr. Afifa has very rich professional experience as hematologist, and currently she is leading important efforts at the National Blood Center of Malaysia aimed at improving implementation of standards and quality and increasing access to plasma-derived therapies across, across the whole country. So Dr. Afifa, based on the very substantive message by the Minister of Health, can you tell us a little bit more about the challenges mentioned by the minister? And yeah. can you share some of the successes achieved by Malaysia in addressing these challenges? Okay, thank you. first of all, thank you, uh, Jan, for uh, the nice introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank you all uh, of you, uh, especially UNITA for inviting me. And I'm glad to be part of the panelists today. As uh, our Minister of Health mentioned that our challenges are actually uh, quite a number of challenges, but the main challenges is actually to get a good volume of quality plasma. Because uh, uh, as uh, she mentioned that we can only accommodate up to about 40 to 60% of the PDMP requirement. Because at the moment, only two centers are actually GMP certified by the fractionator. So, uh, so there's actually a lot of uh, improvement must be put in place so that we can actually increase our plasma uh, for fractionation. You see that uh, actually the amount of plasma sent to the fraction Asian, only 30% of the total uh, collection of the country. This is because that most of the plasma are not actually achieving the GMP standard. So uh, this is something like a simple uh, reason like they don't have the actually a good system in place in some and eh, not all. Uh, in fact, some don't have a good infrastructure, uh, equipment, manpower in terms of skill, 
and also they have encounter financial limitations. So some of them, because of this, they have to throw away their recovered plasma because they don't have the facility to store. This is, for example, of the problem. Lah. For um, at the present moment, we intensify our GMP training. We perform audit in most of the potential collection center. In fact, we coach them to be a better in terms of their quality management system. In fact, our prediction that uh, early next year, at least uh, four bigger centers will come on board to the vaccination uh, program and contribute to the amount of plasma sent. Mm. Okay, another question is that, Yan, you say what are the success story? What I can say is that at the moment, we have a very positive uh, response from the public, especially, especially most after the pandemic. Maybe it's something like a blessing in disguise, you know. After the pandemic, and everybody come forward and want to contribute to help and everything. And we can see that there's a... In fact, we can actually catch up with the previous collection before the pandemic. This is very encouraging. Uh, and I hope this will continue and help us in actually achieving our national fractionation program. Yes, Yen? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afifa. Very encouraging news. Yes. Uh -huh. now I, have, I have a similar question for Dr. Susanna Pisarello, who is the director of the Directorate of blood and transfusion medicine of the Ministry of Health of Argentina. Previously, uh, Dr. Pisarello was the executive, executive director of the Provincial Central Laboratory and worked in Central Blood Bank. So, Dr. Pisarello, can you also share with us what, from your perspective and your experience in Argentina, what are the, your major, major challenges you are facing and what are the successes or achievements that have been made by Argentina? in this regard. Dr. Pisarello will speak in Spanish and our colleague Lea will help us with consecutive interpretation. So Dr. Pisarello, tiene la palabra. Gracias, Anne. Buenos días, buenas tardes. En primer lugar, en nombre del Ministerio de Salud de la Nación Argentina, quiero agradecer al Instituto de las Naciones Unidas para la Formación Profesional y la Investigación. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Jan. First of all, on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Argentina, I would like to thank the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for its kind invitation to participate in this high-level event. Es un honor para nuestro país apoyar esta iniciativa conjunta para satisfacer las necesidades de los pacientes que requieren plasmas y terapias derivadas del plasma. It is an honor for our country to support this joint initiative focusing on meeting patients' need for plasma and plasma-derived therapies. La República Argentina es un país federal que cuenta con 24 jurisdicciones o provincias con autonomía en sus políticas sanitarias. The Republic of Argentina is a federal country composed of 24 jurisdictions called provinces who have autonomy regarding their health policies. Eh, no obstante, en el campo de la hemoterapia, hemos constituido un sistema nacional de sangre regido por el plexo normativo, una ley nacional y normas técnicas, siendo la rectoría ejercida por el Ministerio a través de la Dirección de Medicina Transfusional. However, in the field of chemotherapy, a national blood system has been established, which is governed by a bundle of rules, including the national blood law and its related technical and administrative standards. In this context, the Ministry of Health of Argentina performs an oversight rule through the Directorate of Transfusion Medicine. En el año 2002 se crea este plan nacional tendiente a la centralización de todos los procesos en cada una de las jurisdicciones 
para la crea creando centros regionales provinciales. In 2002, a national blood plan was created, which led to a transformation process aimed at creating provincial hemotherapy centers in charge of fractionation and biological biological classification of blood and thus neutralize the significant numbers of intrahospital blood banks. Hemos conseguido aumentar la donación voluntaria. En un principio era, era de un 2% y hemos logrado en la, en la actualidad un 60% gracias a este plan nacional y a la rectoría de este plan nacional de sangre. Thanks to this national plan, plan we have uh, achieved an increase from 2% to 60% of the voluntary and regular blood donation uh, over the last 20 years. ¿Cuáles son los principales desafíos de Argentina para, eh, para, dar, para garantizar acceso a las terapias de plasma y cuáles son los éxitos que tuvimos? What are the major challenges in Argentina in ensuring access to plasma direct therapies? And what are the successes or achievements that have been made by Argentina in addressing these challenges? El principal y gran desafío es terminar y lograr la centralización del 100% de los procesos de manufactura en cada provincia, incluyendo el subsector estatal o público y el subsector privado. The greatest challenge is to finish and achieve the centralization of manufacturing processes in each province, including both the state and the private subsectors. Lograr la automatización y actualización de la tecnología para estos procesos. Achieving the automation of equipment for manufacturing processes in regional centers. Y llegar, por supuesto, al 100% de la donación voluntaria con políticas públicas nacionales que contemplen la fidelización de ese donante de sangre o plasma. And achieving 100% voluntary donations with national public policies that include donor loyalty. ¿Qué fortalezas tenemos eh, y qué desafíos, qué hemos logrado con estos desafíos? Sorry, I... Ok, ok. Um, ¿Cuáles son los éxitos y logros que hemos tenido eh, desde Argentina al, al enfrentar estos desafíos? What are the successes we have achieved in addressing these challenges? Bueno, tenemos eh, en nuestro país tenemos la Universidad de Córdoba, eh, la Universidad de Córdoba que tiene una planta de hemoderivados. Es la primera planta de Sudamérica, la cual procesa el plasma nacional de todo el territorio argentino y también de Uruguay, de Paraguay y de Chile. Our country has the Blood Projects Laboratory, uh, depending upon the National University of Cordoba, which is the first and only plant in South America, and it processes not only plasma for, from the entire country of Argentina, but also plasma from Uruguay, Paraguay, and Chile. Esa materia prima se obtiene a través de dos procesos, el excedente de plasma y la, plasma, la donación por plasmaféresis. La donación por plasmaféresis aún es muy poca. Queremos llegar a que todo el plasma se ha obtenido por plasmaféresis. This plasma comes from the fractionation of donated units and the percentage obtained through donations by, by plasmaféresis is still very low and we want to increase this. 
por la amplia experiencia que tuvo Argentina en todos estos años en referencia al, al plasma y a la autosuficiencia, hemos recibido cooperación de varios países de la Unión Europea, como ser Francia, España, Italia, con resultados muy satisfactorios, donde podemos destacar una diplomatura que hicimos en medicina transfusional eh, con el acompañamiento del establecimiento francés de sangre. In addition, we have extensive experience in collaboration actions. During recent years, we have received cooperation from several European Union countries, such as France, Spain, and Italy, with extremely successful results. In this regards, it is worth noting the degree in transfusion medicine, which was launched in 2014-2015, with the collaboration of the French blood establishment. Ahora, ¿Cuál es la visión de nuestras prioridades para el futuro, para que haya acceso a las terapias derivadas del plasma? ¿Y qué esperamos o cuál sería la contribución que nos puede dar eh, UNITAR en este sentido? Another question to answer is, what is our vision and priorities for the future of access to plasma-derived therapies? And what specific contributions do we expect from the expert working group existing as part of this initiative. Maybe if you allow me, we can leave this question for the next round uh, of the discussion within the panel so that uh, we can continue uh, now and, and we can come back to this question later, is, if that is okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susana. And uh, muchas gracias, Dr. Pisarello. <laughs> um, now I would like to come to um, another part of the panel, which is uh, which represents probably the most important voice in this whole discussion, and uh, that is the voice of patients, voice of people who are probably the most influenced by the related health conditions, but mostly also by the decisions and policies that govern the access and availability of treatment. So I'm very glad to welcome among us Dr. Johan Prevo who is the executive director of the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies, IPOPI. Dr. Prevo has worked in the healthcare sector for 20 years, and he is a board member of uh, several international bodies, including the European Reference Network on Rare Diseases, and also steering committee member of the platform of plasma products users, the PLUS platform. Through his career, Dr. Prevo has been an advocate and for improving patient access and uh, to early diagnostics and treatment. So from your pers perspective, Johan, as one of the leading global patient organizations, what are the biggest challenges which you see or faced by the PID patients in accessing treatment? And what solutions do you see which can be implemented to address these challenges? Floor is yours, Johan. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, thank you very much uh, to UNITAR for inviting uh, us, um, the patients, to this very important event and more broadly uh, to the initiative since the inception uh, of this uh, project. Um, and thank you, of course, to my distinguished uh, co-panelists and all the participants. I'll start by perhaps reminding us all um, about what it is to live with a primary immunodeficiency. Um, we have to remember that PID patients live with a flawed immune system, which means they are much more vulnerable than others to infections by external pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, fungal agents. Without an appropriate diagnosis and access treatment, that means they face severe, persistent, recurring infections which in turn mean repeat hospitalizations. And this can gradually lead to organ damage, reduce quality of life, or even death. It's therefore really imperative that they have good access to their treatments. Now for a majority of our patients, immunoglobulin replacement therapies are essential medicines for them to live normal and productive lives. 
PID patients on immunoglobulin therapies do not have an alternative treatment option. So that's also very important to highlight. The World Health Organization has categorized immunoglobulins in the treatment of primary immunodeficiencies as essential medicines. So it's really imperative that these immunoglobulins are made available to all patients in every country. However, we know that there have been recurrent supply tensions on Ig therapies or immunoglobulin therapies for many years. And this is mainly due to the fact that the demand is growing at a very fast pace. The demand for immunoglobulin therapies has been growing consistently at a rate of about 8 to 9% per year since 2008. And of course, we have heard already uh, from some of my co-panelists about the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic. It has had a direct impact on plasma supply and therefore on the quantity of IgEs available to our patients. And what these supply tensions mean is sub suboptimal access for patients. That often translates in reduced dosages, longer time between infusions, switching between immunoglobulin brands, switching between mode of administration, and of course, in the worst case scenarios, no access at all uh, to immunoglobulin therapies. All of these leave PID patients more vulnerable to infections and threaten their life and quality of life. However, I think we were also encouraged during the COVID-19 pandemic by the fact that we saw many stakeholders coming from different sides of this field, working together for the sake of patients. When convalescent plasma and hyperimmune globulins were being considered as a potential life-saving treatment for COVID-19, we saw regions, countries, companies from private and public sectors uniting to find solutions. And we feel as patients that we shouldn't wait to have a pandemic to see this type of concerted efforts. With COVID-19, the world suddenly had similar fears and vulnerabilities than most PID patients have every day of their life, whether or not there is a pandemic. I think there's therefore a big lesson to be learned, which is that patients in need of these life-saving therapies deserve to benefit from the same concerted efforts. And there's a real need to strengthen the dialogue between stakeholders and a need for stronger collaborations. I think that the efforts put forward by UNITER are therefore very important to strengthen access to plasma-derived medicinal products. And they are important, but they are also other initiatives that are currently ongoing and can be really complementary. We have the International Coalition for Safe Plasma Proteins, for example, which brings together stakeholders as well and trying to advance uh, the supply of plasma-derived medicinal products in low- and middle-income countries. Recently, I've learned there's also an Asia-Pacific Plasma Leaders Network looking at these issues. And I think what is needed now is for all of these initiatives to really talk to each other, have a dialogue so that we can complement each other. I think each of these initiatives have very specific goals that are very complementary from one another and, and can really help to enhance the situation for patients uh, in this particular region. So I really look forward uh, to continue uh, to discuss in this panel discussion, but also beyond uh, within the other um, initiatives ongoing for the sake of patients. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Johan. And indeed, I hope we will have much more opportunities to discuss how we can cooperate and find synergies between all these initiatives ongoing globally. But now I would like to, to continue in our panel discussion. I have the same question also for our next panelist, Dr. Carlos Safadi Marquez the Vice President of the World Federation of Hemophilia and the President of the Argentina Hemophilia Foundation. Dr. Marquez is a lawyer and has volunteered for both organizations for more than 25 years. And he advised the World Federation on capacity building programs of national organizations and 
also contributes substantively to the development of the strategic goals of the World Federation of Hemophilia. So, dear Carlos, similar question for you. What do you see currently from the perspective of your constituency as the most pressing challenge faced by hemophilia patients and in accessing uh, treatment and how can we overcome them? Thank you, Jan, for, for the presentation. <clears throat> First of all, let me say that also I am a patient with severe hemophilia too. Um, and, and since the vision of the World Federation of Hemophilia, our most important challenge is to provide treatment for all. And when I talk about treatment, I'm not talking only about the access of the product. The treatment is also education. Uh, the access and, and treatment for all is uh, a good regulation in, in, in the national countries level to facilitate the access to treatment um, and, and uh, to provide uh, enough, a good number of health care providers with knowledge uh, for, for, for treatment. It's not only the product. Uh, the product, of course, is is the most important, but uh, these other topics too. And uh, the first problem that, that we face is that around the world, we got identified uh, against the expected hemophilia patients, a low number of patients around the world. Just in case in Africa, uh, we identified only the 8% of the persons with hemophilia. Uh, in, in the Americas, the 58%. In, in Southeast Asia, 17%. The numbers are very low. So uh, the, the first challenge is to increase the, the um, uh, identification of patients in order to provide a good treatment as uh, as a first step. The second one is uh, to create strong patients organizations with high uh, level of power of advocacy uh, because the the advocacy is the is the key of the success of all the stories around the world in in in, in countries with. Uh, with good numbers in 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 treatments, uh, and probably the other most important aspect is to create awareness in all of our governments that uh, they need to understand that they are investing in health, not just spending money. It's not the same concept. Uh, I think that the, the COVID situation teach us a lot. And if in, in a global vision, if I can identify uh, successful stories, uh, like Argentina, for instance, uh, you got the same points in, in all the situations you can find governments who understand the problem, which is very important, uh, um, a strong patients of organizations, uh, a good numbers of experts in the field, um, good treatment centers. And, and this is example how uh, maybe a developing uh, can develop a good treatment uh, for for the community. We, as as you probably know, we measure the 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 treatment level 
in in units uh, per capita around the world, and and uh, if you see uh, uh, the consumed per capita in in in, in countries like more than five units per capita, which is a, a very good uh, with the, the, the rest of the region. We will find countries, Mauritius and South Africa, that reach the one unit per country, uh, per, uh, per capita. So uh, it's a very bad distributed the, the access treatment. And we need to improve the, the, the main message. Carlos, we might have lost you, but I believe that the message got to us. Can you hear us? Yes. I can okay. hear you perfect. No, okay. no. Uh, to 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 sum up, what what I told you is I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes. That um, in 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 countries uh, in Africa, you only find two countries, Mauritius and South Africa, who reach the one unit per capita treatment level, which is the minimum for uh, survive. Uh, but the rest of the continent, they don't reach this number. Uh, and and I don't know if, if, if you reach to, to hear me uh, that in Argentina, the number is more than five units per capita, which uh, it's uh, very good for the region. It's a very good number for the region. So uh, our main challenge is to provide the treatment for almost 70% of the population around the world who, at this moment, they don't have access to treatment. Uh, this is the main challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. This was very insightful. Now, closing the first round of questions of our panel, uh, I'm very glad also to welcome among us a very special guest, Dr. Christian Scherer, who was very kind to accept our invitation despite a bit short notice. Uh, Dr. Scherer is the head of Inspectorate of Swiss Medic, which is the Swiss National Supervisory Authority for Drugs and Medical Products. He's also a member of the WHO Advisory Group on Blood Regulation, Availability and Safety, and the WHO Expert Committee on Biological Standardization. Dr. Scherer, a question for you. Um, drawing on your rich experience in compliance and standards, at different levels, be it national, regional, global levels. What do you see as the main priorities to keep in mind when speaking about, on one hand, how to ensure safety, and on the other, how to ensure availability of plasma-derived therapies for all who are concerned? The floor is yours, Dr. Scherer. Thank you very much for the kind of invitation and I'm glad that I can represent the competent authorities point of view from, from this point of view. <clears throat> um, I think we all agree and uh, that's part of our main uh, vision as, as a competent authority that we have to ensure that the patients only have access to, to safe and effective plasma derived products. <clears throat> uh, so these uh, products, they, they should comply with, with international quality standards and the quality and the safety of these products that starts already with, with collecting uh, safe and high quality plasma as a starting material. We know that uh, we have a unique source, which is the donors, and uh, they either donate blood or plasma uh, for transfusion or for further manufacturing. But I think we, we only have one pool of, of donors and we have to be very careful about this. I think what, what I've, I would put in, in uh, as a first priority is, is really to just do it. I would just think we are talking since 20 or 30 years to, to improve the situation, but finally nobody is, is, is going ahead. I, I'm very happy of, of seeing uh, Malaysia of, of, a, of a country to, to promote in, in this area and, and to go forward. I think there are many plans, many guidelines available how these problems could 
could be tackled. But we have to talk with each other. We do not have to avoid discussions. They may be very controversial, but I think we just have to to do a start. And I think that's a, a, my call would be really to the political leaders of, of the ministries of health to really to initiate and to uh, start this process to put in place a proper regulation, to put in place also a, a competent authority who has a regulatory oversight because we are the competent authority is here to protect the patients and to ensure the, the safety and the quality of the product uh, starting from the from the collection uh, of plasma or, or blood in, in the blood establishments. So <clears throat> I think what we really have to do is really, we just have to start. And I think I, this is maybe my main uh, uh, motivation to participate in in, uh, in this talk here. I think it's it's good to have many different initiatives, but we, we are all aiming to go to the same direction. And uh, we should not be fear uh, of, of having discussions, controversial discussions, we should have uh, development of a, of a common approach uh, for the sake of the patients and only with this i think we 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 have to build in in, in place these regulatory systems these that assure quality and safety also for the uh, health of the donors but also for the sake of of the patients i think we all know that the patients will not have any therapy if we do not have sufficient blood or plasma donations so i, I think we have to really sit together come together uh, discuss together and find common solutions, whether it's private or, or public sector. I think we should not deal about that. We we know what we have strategies in place to ensure safe and, and quality and effective products. And I think we should make use of this knowledge we have gained over the last 30 years. And we just should do it. We just should start the initiatives. That's probably my recommendation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. This uh, concludes our first round of questions within our panel, but before moving uh, further, allow me to thank also our participants for sending the questions. And I would like to remind you again, please use the dedicated question and answers feature of Zoom for submitting your questions. So now I think we can get to the next, um, to continue in our discussion based on what we have just said. I would like to allow me to come back to you, Mr. Seth, uh, because we have heard in the discussion about importance of partnerships, about importance to move ahead, importance, as just Dr. Scherer just said, importance of discussing and having these, these dialogues and even difficult discussions. So we hear often also about the need for both public and private sectors to work together more. From your experience, how can UNITAR work effectively with both public and private sectors partners to achieve shared goals in improving access to health or in general in achieving SDGs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. I think you are touching on a very important subject with uh, Christian Scherer also obliquely referred to. And you know, in the years I've been around in the multilateral system, uh, this kind of thing has been driven ideologically for so long, you know, uh, on the involvement of the private sector and the engagement of private and public sector, especially in areas such as health. It's always been controversial, divisive, and everyone has a view on it. So I think we need an intelligent approach to this. And uh, if I was to look at the SDGs, we are seven years into the SDG implementation, and uh, these have been turbulent years otherwise. We've had political crisis, we have conflict, we have the COVID-19 crisis, and a set of interrelated cascading crises, which have made it very difficult to achieve the SDGs. But uh, I think what works really is uh, strengthened multidimensional partnerships, which was one of the underlying principles of the SDGs. In fact, there's a whole goal, Goal 17, which focuses on partnerships. And partnerships are sometimes difficult to uh, understand. And especially when you look at it from the prism of regulatory and other frameworks, which Christian Scherer mentioned. But without partnerships, without the engagement of civil society, academia, business, governments, 
I don't think we'll get to where we need to get to to achieve the SDGs. So the private public dimension of this is very important. There has to be to get over the ideologies and the conflicts of the past. You need some framework where you feel comfortable in these partnerships and uh, how you come to that level of comfort. Of course, what is happening in Malaysia on the specific issue that we're discussing and what's going to happen in Argentina will provide great examples of how these partnerships can succeed. I'm not saying that public-private partnerships always work, but without engagement of the private sector, nothing will work because they account for 70% of global GDP. They account for many of the resources that we need in academia, in research, and so on. So I would say that let's be careful. Let's move step by step. Let's look at the regulatory and other frameworks that are necessary. But without fostering these partnerships, we are not going to succeed. So I'm a great champion of strengthening public-private partnerships but in intelligent ways, in ways that I see in the chat room, for example, in your Q&A, you have lots of criticism coming from one particular participant around some of the things that we are discussing. And that is an indication to me of the various ways in which people approach some of these issues. And it's important to meet all these concerns in a sensible in a comforting and an intelligent way. So I would say all strength to partnerships, all strength to public-private partnerships. That's the only way we get to uh, achieving not only the health-related goals, but the specific health issue we are discussing today, but do it in a way which leaves a certain comfort level for all. Back to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seth. Um, a similar question also for you, Mr. Platford, uh, but from, again, uh, the perspective of the private sector. We know that these therapies we are talking about can be mm, difficult in terms of affordability and accessibility, especially in low and middle income countries, and we, as we have just heard. So um, uh, what can be done also from the point of view of, of private sector, or, or what is your company, say, uh, what steps are you taking, and how are you collaborating with others, other sectors, including the public sector, to make these therapies more affordable, more accessible for patients in need. Thank, resource, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jan. It's a critical, it's a critical topic, of course. You know, we I've said at the start and, and similar comments have been made that there is significant unmet need for plasma derived therapies around the world. The patients uh, with rare complex and chronic diseases who depend on these treatments often don't have alternatives available to them because these treatments are replacing vital proteins that are deficient in some of these patient populations. And, uh, and of course, there is a, a challenge with the sustainable sourcing of plasma to be able to manufacture these plasma products and ultimately, to your question, ensure that those treatments are accessible in a sustainable way to populations across the world, regardless of which country uh, they are they are in, and this is where partnerships are so important between private sector, public sector, and multiple stakeholders to look at solutions that are tailored to each country to enable that to enable countries to contribute to the global source of uh, supply of plasma, but also um, to ensure that the products that come out the back end of that are are accessible to the patients that uh, that depend on them. Um, there's a wealth of data out there to show the the value, the health economic value. The plasma derived therapies uh, bring through reduced hospitalization, reduced treatment costs, increased productivity in the workforce, uh, avoidance of patients getting sick, often frequently and often severely, uh, to the comments that were made by uh, Mr. Pirat earlier. And, uh, and, uh, and we, we as Takeda do our part to ensure that we are strengthening health systems through partnerships like this. Um, to ensure that not only developed countries, but also developing health systems uh, can find a model that works for them um, to ensure that these treatments can be um, uh, afforded, funded, and importantly, uh, to play their part in contributing to sustainable supply of plasma to enable the manufacture of these, these treatments. And so, so I, would, I would say, again, partnerships are critical. We very much welcome the collaboration that we have with UNITAR. We're very much appreciative 
of the ministries of health from Argentina and Malaysia to putting themselves forward to be pilots in this important collaboration. And of course, I'm very happy to have the voice of the patient here today as well from, uh, from EPOPI and, and, and WFH. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bufford. Um, Dr. Scherer, I would like to come back to you because you also particularly mentioned this, this need of uh, having dialogue and, and speaking to each other. You take part uh, in many expert discussions. Uh, I, in particular, I would like to highlight the global bodies, including the WHO uh, expert committees. So um, also um, referring to one of the questions um, from one of the participants in, in the Q&A, what is your perception of the quality of the dialogue and collaboration across the, these different sectors and within these global bodies? How these different sectors manage to come together? What are the strengths and what can be done better in this dialogue at the global level? Yeah, that's uh, of course uh, the meetings where I or where we meet regularly is, is, is mainly among regulators so uh, of course we we know that we have to work towards a common uh, objective uh, blood and plasma is is not uh, limited to a national uh, problems or, or, or issue it, it's becoming global and and we we all work towards to get together uh, to the same way how can we best assure uh, quality of, of the plasma derivatives and, and, and of the blood components as well. So because we also have patients who, who have need for, for blood components. And <clears throat> I think by, by developing, we, we agreed or we achieved to best uh, uh, draft common understanding of, of quality standards like uh, the good manufacturing practice, which have been mentioned. They are almost globally harmonized among the the, um, the authorities and, and these tools are, are here and, and just need to be uh, put into a process to, to be uh, established in, in, in each country. And so I think this is a very interactive and, and uh, important discussion that we continue this and we can learn all from, from each other. Where we have other meetings where we involve uh, other stakeholders for uh, plasma industry or, or blood organizations, I think it's, it's very important that Con discussions also takes place there to, to develop a common understanding, a common language, be because uh, we, we should uh, know what to do if, if we sell plasma to a fractionator, what is the expectation of a quality standard we need. And we all know that there is still a lot of plasma available which does not uh, meet the quality standard, which has to be destroyed. It's millions of liters. Uh, with have are, are available but cannot be used for fractionation because uh, of a poor quality and i think so putting in place these uh, these uh, technologies or these uh, standards need everybody's effort from the uh, blood organizations together with the uh, with the uh, uh, plasma industry and and the regulators who finally has the oversight on on, on both activities and i think especially in, in the process where you, you put in place a new system or, or you you start like in, in malaysia or indonesia it, it was very helpful to have everybody on the table to discuss together and to see what has each one has its role has its responsibility and and this has to be aware and this has to be agreed upon and i think this was a very helpful start later when this the system is more established i think each one will continue its role the supervisory will have an independent role to to check uh, blood organizations but also plasma industry if they comply with the requirements but i think at the beginning it is very essential to have this dialogue thank you Thank you indeed, and very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for your comments. Um, I would like to now come to our representatives of uh, Malaysia and Argentina. And uh, in a sense, I will also start uh, replying or re uh, try to uh, respond to some of the questions which we have in the Q&A. Uh, there are some questions related to particular health conditions and uh, what can be done or what steps are or measures are taken to address these conditions. So I would like to ask, first of all, Dr. Afifa, you spoke about um, the encouraging developments in Malaysia, about the challenges, um, but can you tell us what is your vision and the, your priorities for the future of access of these plasma-derived therapies? Uh, what 
to, to give at least some, some overview of what Malaysia is going to focus on with, with the aim to, to address these health conditions, which also have been uh, asked about in the, in the Q&A. So what is your vision and priorities for the future? And uh, may, maybe what specific contribution or what are your expectations also from this particular initiative? Okay, I actually, uh, thank you, Jan, for the question. Actually, I strongly believe that Malaysia will achieve self-sufficiency in red cell as well as uh, PDMP. That for sure, definitely. Uh, maybe it's not my career time, but eventually we will uh, achieve that. This is uh, what we focus now to actually aggressively promote the blood donation, which I can see the response actually now very good. Now we emphasize on the GMP. So hopefully soon uh, we will be able to actually send all our plasma for fractionation. Although Malaysia has a very small country with small number of population, but we think that with the projected number uh, of, uh, of course, the demand actually depend on the red cell drive. Huh? The, the red cell actually the driver for collection. But in terms of achieving PD, uh, cell sufficient for PDMP, we will try our best to achieve that uh, soon. Yeah? And then for this initiative, I can see very positive impact. We can learn from each other. Like we are still um, learning for like Argentina, they have progressed, they have planned, but we are still doing total fractionation. This is something like we must learn from Argentina. We share our experience, maybe whatever challenges you have faced before, we can learn and uh, apa, make the time uh, even shorter to achieve our aim. Lah. And then uh, I really appreciate everybody uh, our opinion as well as the patient representative because that will determine also uh, the our commitment as well as government support. Because in terms of this, I think the government support is fundamental. As uh, Cheryl, uh, as Carlos mentioned earlier, that government are supposed to invest, not just giving money and we spend. We want to invest for a better healthcare in future for our next generation. That's my point of view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctora, uh, Doctora Fifa. Now coming back to Argentina, Doctora Bisarello, I would like also ask you uh, what are your plans what are your priorities for the future uh, with regard to improving access to plasma derived therapies and uh, also what do you, do you expect from this initiative how this can be helpful for argentina the floor is yours gracias ian eh, principalmente eh, continuar eh, continuar trabajando de forma integrada con las asociaciones científicas eh, continuar con la centralización de los procesos y con la capacitación continua. Tratar de ir evolucionando de acuerdo a la ciencia. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, Lea. Okay, thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Jan. Um, well, first, who would like to continue working with these scientific associations and uh, well continue working with them to keep going on the centralization of their processes. Okay, gracias. Um, apuntamos a crear un programa de donación de plasma por aféresis que nos permita acercarnos a, las, a los objetivos de que la población tenga acceso a estas terapias. We will create and develop a plasma donation program by plasma pheresis, which will allow us to address the objective of, of ensuring people's access to plasma derived therapies. Para lograr este programa, tenemos que cumplir con dos objetivos anteriores: la centralización del sector público y privado y el 100% de donantes voluntarios. 
to reach these objectives, we have two well, previous objectives to achieve. First, the centralization of the processes and then 100% of voluntary donations. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. My last question uh, within this panel goes to Carlos and Johan again, because uh, I really believe we need to keep in mind that in the end of the day, what really matters is the real impact on real people, something what we have already heard today. So um, can you tell us um, what are the expectations of your organizations and your constituencies uh, from this initiative, like the one we launched today? And, and what can do we more and better at international level so that we can help connect the global level with, with the local level to make real impact uh, for the people who need it most? Carlos, you first have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Please, first of all, let me remind you that I belong to a community who still is in shock after the HIV, HCB tragedy. So for us, it's important the access to a safe treatment. And, and uh, this is uh, a main topic for us, which is still very important. Uh, and and um, I am very happy with this initiative because uh, finally, we understand that uh, the government, patient community, industry, and healthcare providers can work together to improve the quality of life of the patients around the world, uh, which is extremely very important. Uh, and and in this scenario, the the um, it's extremely useful how we can share information and <clears throat> improve the quality of life. In the 70s, the treatment was very expensive. Now, the treatment is too much affordable. So uh, in this situation, it's not fair that the patients don't have access to a good treatment uh depending where they live uh so uh the 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 key is to work together for uh improve the quality of life with with advocacy with knowledge with education with compromise for all the 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 sides in in the table johan over to you well, thank you, Jan, um, and thank you, everyone, for, for this very interesting discussion. I think in, in your last question, Jan, you highlighted two important words, that's local and global. I think for me, uh, as the global community, we need to have only one goal, and that's global sufficiency in plasma-derived medicinal products. To get there, we will need more education. We will need to have policies that recognize the important differences between blood and blood products, which are usually used locally, and between plasma and plasma-derived medicinal products, which ultimately are global resources. Again, we've seen that during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think if we, if we dream a little about what the perfect world would be for patients with primary immunodeficiency, this would start by being a world without shortages, without supply tensions, in which each patient can have the treatment that most suits them. So it's very important to, to remember that when it comes to immunoglobulin therapies, these are not generic therapies. They should be approached as individualized treatments. So for us, when we talk about national self-sufficiency, we, we're quite short of that dream. Of course, global sufficiency needs to start somewhere. Countries need to mobilize to collect more so that their regions become stronger. 
And when there are shortages, having a more regionally balanced collection between each world region will help. But when there are no shortages, it will also allow for the perfect treatment to reach the right patient. And so we need to really keep that ultimate goal of what gold standard treatment means for patients. So of course, to, to, to reach this goal, we will face challenges. Uh, just recently, we, we faced a terrible pandemic. Uh, we know that. But we, we therefore need to talk together and collaborate to explore what are the best strategies to strengthen plasma collection and better access to immunoglobulins. We at IPOPI, we work regularly with our friends at the World Federation of Hemophilia and also many other patient organizations, including through our work with PLUS, which is a, a platform bringing together different patient organizations. And we have been advocating for more regionally balanced plasma collection to reach this global sufficiency goal for many years now. We know that the US has been collecting most of the world's plasma, about 67%, and we need to have more balance in, in the collection. So each region needs to take steps urgently to collect more. Even in Europe, we have a deficit in plasma collection, just to mention that. It's not only uh, in low and middle income countries, regions. So for me, the key to this will be plasmapheresis. We know that most plasma nowadays, about 90% comes from apheresis plasma. Uh, plasmapheresis allows donors to donate more plasma more often. So this is the way forward. We need to really put efforts and strategize how we can increase plasmapheresis. Does that mean we don't need recovered plasma? Of course it doesn't, but we need to take stock of the last 20 years and what has been contributing until now, collect more plasma, because it's urgent that we collect more plasma. So improving policies and strengthening regulatory oversight in low and middle income countries to ensure GMP is implemented and collection organizations will be key to collect more plasma. I think we've heard a colleague from Malaysia highlighting the GMP issues already. Small scale fractionation, contract fractionation should be considered as strategies to fractionate this plasma. Fractionation plant, we have the nice example of Argentina, but of course this is something that needs to be done carefully and only when the appropriate conditions are met. So I really think it's a stepwise approach that needs to be implemented. And last but not least, I think I will come back uh, to the wise words of Dr. Seth, who highlighted the need for public-private partnerships. I'm myself a strong believer that the way forward is through better collaboration between both the public and the private sectors. I think by uniting efforts, expertise, resources, um, we will have the proper strategy uh, to move forward. So in terms of us, the patient organizations, and, and perhaps our role in all this, I think based on our experience, what we have found is that often so, we, we are able to act as the common denominator. The common denominator in discussions that are sometimes difficult between stakeholders who may not always agree on what the best strategies or the best approaches are to get to this goal of improved plasma supply and better access to plasma-derived medicinal product. But ultimately, all of these stakeholders have at their core the same objective, which is to meet patients' needs. And so I think that the role of patient organizations in bringing together the stakeholders in a patient-centered manner uh, will be very um, important and crucial uh, in moving forward with these types of initiatives. So it goes without saying that we at IPOPI are committed that we ensure that we promote this type of collaboration this type of multi-stakeholder collaboration and focus on reaching our common goal of access to plasma-derived medicinal products for all patients in need, no matter where they live in the world. So this would be my concluding work, uh, words um, for this important question, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Johan, for these very, very insightful and very nice comments. And that very much wraps up also the the discussion of the panel. 
which we just concluded. And thank you very much. This has been a very exciting and insightful discussion all, overall. We heard many different perspectives, something that also is very much something that very much represents the character of this particular initiative to have all these voices at the table and speak to each other. Now it is time to give space to our audience. And uh, thank you, dear participants, for all the positive feedback and uh, all your questions uh, which you have sent in written. Much appreciated. That is the best sign of genuine interest. And I believe we have already tried to address uh, some of these questions during the panel, but we still have a few minutes left to answer a few more. Uh, so just very, very quickly, uh, one question for um, Mr. Seth, uh, which is uh, coming from the audience. It is related to involvement of parliaments that have a big that should have a big role in this discussion. And one of the participants is asking, how can UNITAR work with parliamentarians? Uh, so my question to you would be, what, what kind of engagement do we have at UNITAR with parliaments and parliamentarian representatives? Very briefly. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. And to answer that question, I'd like to say that, you know, UNITAR has multiple engagements with parliamentarians. Many of them are thematic in character because we are dealing with an organization called the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. So that's one facet of our cooperation with parliamentarians. Then we have the Interparliamentary Union, which is based in Geneva, IPU. We have multiple thematic engagements with them. We have done in several countries in Anglophone and Francophone Africa, the training of parliamentarians to better equip them on good legislation around environmental issues, uh, modeled on similar legislation that might have been enacted in several other parliaments. So we've been training uh, the parliament in Kenya on sensible climate legislation, on environmental other legislation, uh, where uh, you know sharing experiences helps. So we've been using uh, our contacts with parliamentarians, but on the question raised, I do agree that parliamentarians have a very important role. And sensitizing parliamentarians sometimes is a big challenge, uh, especially on more specific, detailed things that we are looking at in this panel today. Parliamentarians are burdened by so many issues that to bring specific things onto their plate is often a challenge, but the importance of bringing health issues onto the plate of parliamentarians and to have a genuine conversation around the controversies. Don't run away from controversies. Uh, that's what I say. There is no substitute for getting every different mind around a decision table. You can have a durable solution only if all points of view are respected around a table. We sometimes take for granted, and I think that's the training we need to give parliamentarians that it's not only like-minded parliamentarians who should pass legislation, bring in everybody. And that's the only way to have a long lasting, durable solution. That's also issues of peace and war. And I think it's equally applicable to every issue we look at. So training of parliamentarians, thematic-based training of parliamentarians and sensitizing them to the complexity of some of the issues they deal with. Back to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the sake of time, because we are on the top of the hour, this was the last question for today. And uh, we will not be able to respond to all of them uh, right away, but we will try to do so by email or um, on our website. So please stay tuned. And uh, now let me just uh, close this meeting because as we come to the end of this discussion, I would like to take a moment. Um, to thank once again to all of you, panelists, our partners, and all the participants for your invaluable contributions to this discussion and the whole initiative. And uh, what we can take home from today's discussion, I believe, is the importance of really having these partnerships and willingness to talk and to work together. And uh, the success of this particular initiative also proves the power of collaboration. And only then we can achieve meaningful progress, as Johan spoke as well, and make a real difference in the lives of people. So together we have started this conversation that will help us, we hope, to better understand the barriers which are also among us and 
how we can overcome them, how we can begin addressing the real challenges of real people. I would like to, before concluding, I would like to remind everyone also about, again, about this online platform of this initiative that has been launched today. And uh, it is here, it is for you to serve all of you who are interested in this topic and in collaboration. The goal of this platform is to make it a place where you can come, you can come back again and find what you really are looking for. Together with our partners, our team at UNITAR will be doing their best to constantly update the content to reflect your needs and the new developments. And your suggestions, your feedback are very much welcome. You are invited to use the contact form on the website to get in touch with the team. So once again, I would like to thank you all for your contributions to this important initiative. And on behalf of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, I look forward to continuing this work together and to the progress in improving access to plasma-derived therapies. Thank you all for being, us, being with us today. This meeting has ended.